Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Physics Department at the Colorado School of Mines. Last time we set up the dispersion and we looked at the heat capacity from phonons. Today we're going to build on that and look at how the thermal conductivity of a material is directly related to heat capacity. Let's start today with Fourier's law, which is going to relate a flux of thermal energy to a temperature gradient in terms of this material coefficient thermal conductivity. I want to emphasize that this is an intrinsic material property and isn't dependent upon the geometry of your sample. If you're thinking about the geometry of the sample, you should be thinking about thermal conductance. With Fourier's law in mind, we're going to start by considering the heat flux using an ideal gas model. So we're going to have particles in some sort of tube, and there's going to be a hot side and a cold side, and we're going to be thinking about the particle fluxes in this tube. So if I think about the flux in the positive x direction, you can imagine that that's going to be related to the velocity of those particles in the x direction, as well as the number density of particles. However, half are going to be going the wrong way, and so we have this half term up front. Particle flux is all well and good, but we really want to think about the flux of energy. So let's let lowercase c be our heat capacity per particle. In that case, if I have a single particle moving from t to t plus delta t, once the particle is at t plus delta t, you might expect it to absorb energy from the system as it thermalizes and the amount of energy you might expect it to absorb would be its heat capacity, C, times delta T. So that makes it actually pretty easy for us to go from a flux of particles to a flux of energy. All we have to do is multiply by the C delta T term. And for particle motion in the opposite direction, where a particle is at T plus delta T, and it's going over into the colder T region, we're likewise going to find that energy is going to be released, and that amount of energy released is C delta T. So we can again write the same expression, and together we get this net expression at the bottom. This is all well and good, but we don't really have a sense of what this delta t is. So we consider then two thermalizing collisions that are not at the same position in x in the sample. The particle comes in, thermalizes at t1, moves on to t2, rethermalizes. So between these two points, we can think of a delta t. Additionally, there must be some L sub x associated with these two points, and so we can then write delta t in terms of this L sub x as well as the temperature gradient. It's also nice to recast L sub x in terms of the velocity in the x direction and this tau, which denotes the time between collisions. Bringing these expressions together, we can write that delta t is the temperature gradient times the velocity times your relaxation time between collisions. Substituting this back into our energy flux expression, we get the following. The first term we're going to pick at here is this v sub x term. Let's put that instead in terms of the root mean square velocity v. On average, we expect the x, y, and z components of the velocity to be equal. Moving along, we can substitute that into our energy flux expression, and we can also take that tau in one of our velocity terms, recast that as l, and we can take our particle density and our heat capacity per particle and then write that as heat capacity per volume. Okay, we're about done with this business. What we have now is the energy flux related to the temperature gradient with some coefficients that we can think about, specifically the heat capacity of the system, the mean free path between collisions, and the velocity. And relating back to Fourier's law, this is the thermal conductivity coefficient. Denoting thermal conductivity as kappa, we see that two of the terms we can directly get from the dispersion, the heat capacity and the velocity. However, this L term is kind of a big mystery right now. The first thing you can see is that if you don't have any scattering, then your thermal conductivity goes to infinity. So scattering must be present in all materials. So very briefly then, let's consider what causes scattering. Largely, we can break it down into two components. The first is that we're not working with infinite crystals, nor are they absolutely perfect. And so in practice, you have point defects, you have grain boundaries, and you have surfaces. Second, once you move outside of the harmonic approximation, phonons are able to interact with other phonons and scatter off of them. So at high temperatures, where you have a high density of phonons, you would correctly expect that phonon-phonon scattering could be a big deal. Okay, next time we're going to look closely at phonon-phonon interactions and approximate their impact on thermal conductivity. However, don't expect this to be robust. Transport theory is a huge field, and we're just skimming the surfaces here. So if this feels hand-wavy, my apologies in advance. All right, see you next time.